Well, good afternoon, everybody, and, and thank you so much, um, John and Chris, um, first of all, for uh, inviting me to this uh, conference. Um, I must admit, hearing my biography like that, I thought, oh, blimey, what am I doing running UCAS? But um, anyway, there we are. Um, but I, I just do want to congratulate you because um, UCAS also has a little events company within it. So we, we know how much work goes into putting on an event like this. Um, and it seems to me just in the short time that I've been here that it's incredibly well attended and have such a, um, a lot of companies exhibiting downstairs. Um, I think that's fantastic. So many congratulations on uh, getting such a successful event uh, together. Um, so, I uh, hope it's not too soon after lunch to subject you to, uh, to Prezi. So, anyone feeling seasick, um, reach for the sick bags or whatever. Um, what I'm going to do this afternoon is, um, I'm just going to tell you a little bit about UCAS. Um, uh, I'm going to just paint you a little bit about what's going on in the admissions landscape, really sort of looking at what's happened since the um, tuition fee rises in England, which have kind of rippled through not just England, but Scotland, Wales, and Northern Ireland as well. Uh, talk about some of UCAS's um, IT challenges, and then tell you a little bit about our uh, digital acceleration um, initiative. Um, if we have a bit of time at the end, um, I'll be happy to try and answer some questions as well. Um, so just starting with um, what is UCAS's vision. Um, and I, d I just still really love this vision because we say that we want UCAS to be at the heart of connecting people to higher education. Um, and that seems to me to, to sum it all up. We don't say the hub or the centre and we do say the heart advisedly um, because it seems to me that uh, connecting people to higher education still needs a lot of heart and it needs a lot of personal care and attention uh, for something that's so important to each and every uh, individual that we do connect with. Um, so that's our, our vision. Our mission is actually um, a new one, so um, I'd be interested to hear what people think about this. We've slightly branched out and we've said actually that our mission is about inspiring progression in education and facilitating progression in education, and that we do that through uh, information services and admissions services and I think it's easy to think of UCAS as being just about you know people who want to apply to full-time undergraduate education fill in the form off it goes conditional offers etc etc but actually in order to get people to that place we believe that UCAS has got um, an increasingly stronger role um, around uh, uh, giving information and advice and increasingly of course to people um, who perhaps are the first uh, in their family to experience higher education and really don't have that kind of mind map of what it's, what it's all about that uh, most of us perhaps take for granted. <coughs> Very clear that our universe is education, but that higher education is absolutely um, our heartland. <coughs> we are a charity. Uh, we're a charity with a commercial subsidiary, so um, actually it looks like uh, USISA is a very similar setup now to UCAS and lots of other charities that are set up like that. We operate out of pretty much a, a single site, although we do now have a very small footprint in, um, in London as well, um, in Cheltenham, which is not very easy to get to, but um, very beautiful, and we're right near the race course, so um, if anyone fancies a flutter, that's handy as well. And we're about 450 uh, employees. It is important to remember, though, that as a charity, um, we are regulated and the charity commissioners want our trustees to report on the public benefit that we deliver. <coughs> so it's not just enough to consider UCAS as an organisation that provides services to, to you in your universities and colleges it is actually part of our charitable mission uh, that we provide public benefit and actually help learners progress um, and participate in higher education. Uh, just in terms of our size, we, we have an annual turnover of about £40 million, um, so not a very huge company. 
Uh, we're entirely self-funded, so we don't have any kind of government funding at all. Some people, I think, think we're a, a government organization. We're very keen to uh, dispel that myth. So that money comes um, from applicants who pay a fee when they apply through UCAS. Um, universities then pay us a fee when they enroll somebody through the UCAS service. Um, and then our commercial subsidiary, UCAS Media, um, is the third source of revenue. It's not quite a third, a third, a third, but it's not far off um, that. <coughs> when I say we have no government funding, it's almost purposeful that we don't. So, for example, um, just over a year ago when the arrangements for teacher training uh, were changed, um, the uh, government agency that um, uh, organizes teacher training, NCTL, um, asked us to redevelop our scheme so that we could um, accept applications for school direct and have schools using the system as well. Uh, we did do that. We, we redeveloped UCAS teacher training, but we did it at our own cost. Uh, because we don't want to hold any government contracts. Uh, by the way, I bear the scars of working for central government, which basically means that every time you've got a really good plan laid out, um, ministers uh, foul it up by not giving you the right decisions or changing the budget or whatever. Um, so we've, we've very deliberately stayed very independent, and our kind of guiding light is what our users want us to do. And our users are all of you in your universities, uh, and colleges, their applicants, their teachers and advisors, their parents of students who are aspiring uh, to progress in education, uh, their awarding bodies and other stakeholders as well. So we're very much guided by what our users want us um, to do. <coughs> but just to talk about um, UCAS in higher education, so the uh, the coordinates of this is that, that, that we're serving about 163 universities, um, uh, another 160-something university colleges and uh, colleges offering HE, altogether about 700 um, different kinds of higher education providers, um, uh, between them offering um, usually between sort of 30 and 40,000 different courses um, or programs in higher education. The undergraduate service, which was the original service um, that was set up as UCCA, is by far the largest part of UCAS's business. Um, <coughs> some of you, I don't think there's too many in this room who might have gone through the service when it was UCCA, as it was set up in the early 60s. Um, oh, we've had a couple of, yeah, uh, oh my goodness, we've got quite a few. Um, <coughs> I just, this is my favorite slide that I have in my massive slide library. This is actually showing you applicants and um, admissions going back to 1962, which was the first um, admission cycle that UCCA did. Um, and it shows you, I don't think I've got a pointer on this, but back in 62, there was, I don't know, barely 50,000 applicants, um, probably about 23, 24,000 um, admitted. Uh, think about it, they would have been nearly all men. They would have nearly all come from independent schools and grammar schools uh, and um, uh, probably not too many international. They all would have had GCSE A levels. Fast forward uh, over 50 years to 2014 cycle when we had close on 700,000 applicants coming through uh, the undergraduate service each making up to five choices, so that's three million plus applications handled, and for the first time over half a million uh, admitted to UKHE. Um, and of course, they were from a much more diverse set of backgrounds. For a start, many more women than, uh, than young men now, which I personally find quite uh, worrying. Uh, people from very diverse backgrounds, um, and, of course, many more international students as well. So um, I put this up, um, partly because I just love the slide. Incidentally, that bit in the middle is where the Polytechnic Service joined um, for a bit and then joined with, UK, uh, with UCCA to become, uh, to become UCAS. The reason I put this up is to remind us all that UCAS is probably the first, the original, and probably arguably one of the most successful shared services in the higher education 
uh, sector, but it's so embedded and it's been around for so long uh, that we probably forget that it's a, a shared service. The other thing I find extraordinary about this is that actually a group of, in my view, visionary vice chancellors back in the late 50s and early 60s um, put together this business model. And when I look at the um, admissions rules, for, uh, 1963 is the earliest booklet that I can find in our ar archive. And it's actually pretty much the same business model that we operate today. Pretty much the same business model. I can't think of too many other business processes uh, that have survived so uh, recognizably intact um, as uh, what we do at UCAS. So I'm intensely proud, in case you haven't already realized that, I'm intensely proud of um, uh, being uh, the, the privilege of, of stewardship of this uh, amazing organization. Um, so that's a bit about higher education. We are a bit more than higher education. So this is just a screen grab off our uh, UCAS.com, our website, uh, one of the busiest websites in the country. Um, and you can see here, if you look at the tabs on that, there's a tab called After GCSE. So we now offer um, a UCAS-style process for people who, at 16, are deciding, well, do I stay at school? Do I go to a sixth form college? Do I go to an FE college? Maybe do an apprenticeship? What qualifications do I want to do? What courses and provision uh, is available near to me? And we believe that by actually starting to interact with these young people at an earlier age, not only can we guide them um, on their progression route, but we can start um, to uh, make sure that they understand what their options are um, after school or college. <coughs> and we don't have that kind of heartbreaking tragedy when somebody finds out only when they're 18 that they haven't got the right qualifications to follow their dream at university because they didn't get good advice uh, at that stage. Um, you'll see also that it's not just uh, undergraduate degrees, so we have a, a service for the conservatoires as well. As you can imagine, that's quite a small bespoke service. The teacher training one um, I mentioned earlier. Uh, postgraduate, we offer a postgraduate admission service, about 20 universities um, participating in that. And then just look at that little tab there saying, not sure, question mark, question mark. Um, and that really goes back to what I was saying about um, the important role, I think, that UCAS has um, around advocacy for higher education. You know, and these people who are the first in their family to consider university education, you know, those are the people who don't readily know that Oxford Brooks will be better for some things than Oxford and that Oxford will be better than Oxford Brooks for other things. They don't have that kind of DNA that we all use to understand um, uh, the sector. And of course, the growth in higher education at the moment is primarily coming um, from those uh, of more disadvantaged backgrounds. The kind of middle class, A-level, typical progression route is pretty much saturated um, and has been so for probably 10 years or more. So it's absolutely vital that we don't make that assumption that somebody already wants to come to university and, and is looking for something specific. We need to actually give them some roadmaps for thinking about the decision to go to university in the first place um, and indeed then guide them through the steps to help them uh, make uh, those choices. Um, so, uh, so I put up these um, screen grabs and I said that UCAS.com is an incredibly... Um, incredibly busy website um, and just in the space of just over five years I've been with UCAS uh, now um, it's just I mean it, it wasn't even like this five years ago the explosion in digital and social communications uh, that we undertake um, and just you know just looking at some of the, the numbers up here of, of how we're reaching out to people through um, all the different social media um, channels and it changes the dynamic of the organization I'm sure that's also happening uh, in your universities instantly I see people taking photographs I think there is going to be um, a circulation of the of the deck so um, so you'll get some of this kind of thing but what I see also UCAS incidentally has um, a contact center so we have about 50 
people in UCAS who take, I don't know, two, three thousand calls day in, day out, week in, week out. Um, and I see, I just can start to see the number of phone calls beginning to reduce as there's more and more information shared and available um, online and that must be a good, um, a good thing. Um, so, uh, so that's um, a shot of, um, of, of some of the stuff we do on social media. Here's a shot of some of the stuff that happens on one day in UCAS. Um, so I've kind of tried to big it all up, you know, we're a, we're a busy company all the time and then we just have this one week of, um, you know, when my blood pressure uh, is getting dangerously high and within that one week there's one day when all of our customer um, groups want maximum access to all of our services um, and, uh, and you can see some of the numbers on here, 55 million uh, views on UCAS.com 109,000 Twitter interactions, 154 video views. Actually, UCAS now employs a full-time uh, filmmaker who's making little video clips and little animations and how-to videos because that's how uh, young people get their uh, information. And of course, <coughs> confirmation and clearing, not only is it a big day for us, it's actually a huge day for students. It's a huge day for schools and uh, parents uh, and it's a huge day for, for all of you but just to um, concentrate on our pain um, since I've got the platform um, this is the kind of operation that we're uh, running so we download about 5 million individual exam results ca matched candidate results from the awarding bodies and we transmit them out to our universities and colleges when uh, track, which is the way that students find out whether their place has been confirmed, when that opens, uh, and we never give an exact time, we do a sort of soft opening around 7 o'clock on A-level day, and that peaks at something like 200, uh, last year I think it was 239 logins per second. That doesn't go on for very long and it tails off quite quickly, thank goodness. Um, but uh, as you can see, that's, a, that's a, pretty, um, a pretty strong peak that we deal with. And then on that single day, we deal with about 18,000 um, telephone calls and in fact we outsource um, burst capacity to Serco who deal with kind of like, oh, I've forgotten my login or people who ring up and say, can you just, is it really true I've got in? So we kind of, we have people uh, doing that. <coughs> so just massive, uh, massive um, traffic uh, onto our systems. Um, so uh, thank God for the cloud uh, because um, there's just, there was just no way that UCAS could afford to gear up its kind of its own uh, server capacity um, just for those short periods. It would have been completely um, uneconomic. Um, and so as the higher education sector has grown and grown, luckily the cloud came to our rescue um, just in time for us. So we can dial up that capacity. Um, just for that uh, sort of month or so when it gets um, very hairy um, back in Cheltenham. Okay, so that's a bit about um, the operations that we run. Um, <clears throat> I'm just going to run you through just a few coordinates of what's going on uh, in the admissions um, area. So one of the things about UCAS, which I absolutely adore, is that we have the most fantastic database and there's nothing that I can't go and find out. You know, I know up till yesterday who's going to university, who isn't, who's applied, who hasn't. And I put this slide up and I'd invite you to look at the orange line, which is the England line. This is a young entry rate um, uh, over this period. And we say it's the cohort because it, it, it adds the 18 and 19 year olds together. So just very quickly, um, thinking about the period, the year before the fees came in in 2011, there wasn't really a, a, a sudden increased demand in higher education, but there was a rush to get in. So people who normally would have deferred didn't. They went in 2011. Uh, so there was a rush to get in, not a rush to apply. Um, so in 2012, we started that year with higher fees a massive um, deficit of, of usually the, you know, the tens of thousands of pre-booked places through deferrals, then a slight drop in demand caused by the fees, and 2012 was 50,000 enrolments down. Very, very painful 
uh, for the sector. But of course, in 2013, they all came up. So those 18-year-olds who kind of paused and thought, ooh, is it really worth 9,000 a year? They all came back in, in, in as 19-year-olds uh, in 2013. And then deferrals got back onto the normal track. So what this, looking at the 18 and 19-year-olds together, um, this actually smooths out what was, of course, you know, quite a bumpy and quite a tense time uh, in higher education. Um, incidentally, the other big thing that happened over that period was people realized that the higher fee rates did not, as a lot of people anticipated, put off people from more disadvantaged backgrounds. If anything, um, the, the people who were put off were those uh, from more affluent um, backgrounds. So we can all heave a huge sigh of relief. Everything's kind of back on normal and yippee, we can just get back to the day job. But of course it's not like that when you look at an institutional level. So uh, I'm not sure if it's provocative to call this the winners and losers slide, but what I've done here is each blob is a university. Um, dark green is high tariff, so in other words, more selective institutions, medium tariff uh, and low tariff. Uh, roughly a third, a third. Um, so you can uh, see what's happening. And basically, if you're on the left of this diagram, uh, you recruited uh, fewer undergraduate students um, in 2014 than you did in 2011. In other words, you never recovered after all those ups and downs. Um, and if you're on the bottom of this chart, um, you did worse in 2014 than the previous year. So obviously, if you're in the uh, bottom left-hand box, which is never a good place to be on a, a kind of a four-box uh, <laughs> matrix. Um, you begin to see how um, a market has started to be created. And what we start to see is the people who struggled in this new environment, this more, uh, more of a market, um, uh, are getting weaker each year and the strong are getting stronger. And you get that kind of polarization that you see um, in other markets. So although the headline figures, you know, I'm sure the, um, uh, the Chancellor of the Exchequer somewhere in his budget speech will have mentioned, you know, how many lots of people are going to university. Of course, at, a universe, at an individual institution level, um, things are um, still very, very competitive and in some cases very difficult indeed. <coughs> a quick look at what's really driving these changes. I don't think it's... Um, uh, tuition fees. It's about the changing qualifications pipeline, the way people perceive A-levels, and uh, HEP, higher education provider responses, offer making. So we'll just take a very quick look at this. So I mentioned um, that the sort of affluent group, flat participation, it means also that the number of people coming out of higher education with A-levels is flat. But look at those orange lines the number of people with BTECs, which is a vocational applied style of qualification, that in, in the past would never have been seen as a solid progression route to higher education. Now, in 2014, over 100,000 uh, young people coming into higher education with BTECs. Um, now, at the same time as that change in the qualifications is taking place, we're in the middle of a downturn in the demographics. So the population of 18-year-olds started falling in about 2009. It'll go on falling till about 2020, and it then takes another 10 years or so to get back to those levels. So imagine what those um, changes in the qualification pipeline um, extrapolated onto those population estimates, and you get what is a very, very challenging picture for universities uh, for student recruitment because what happens is that the number of people coming out of secondary education with A-levels is tracking the population down and the number of people coming out uh, with vocational qualifications is growing and that extrapolation looks, you know, in five years' time it's something like 15,000 fewer people with A-levels um, and, I don't know, 35,000 more with vocational qualifications. Um, and this is a huge challenge, of course, particularly for those in the selecting um, sector of, um, of higher education um, who typically need people with academic A-levels uh, in order to support success in their degree programs. <coughs> and this pattern is partly the reason that, so we had this um, exemption from student number controls for those with high grades, ABB, 
uh, in A-levels and equivalents. And bizarrely, it was actually the high tariff group, the most selective group, that has um, had a decrease in the proportion of their recruits with these higher grades. And it's the lower tariff institutions, the more recruiting institutions, um, that have grown uh, their proportion with these higher grades. And of course, they've grown that from uh, students with BTECs rather than A-levels. Um, so in amongst all these difficult things, um, the sector has been making masses of offers. So you can see there that top line there was um, rather bizarrely a drop in the number of offers made in 2012. I and mean, that was never going to work. Making fewer offers to fewer applicants was never going to produce a very good result. But the sector learned very quickly. Um, and if you're an applicant, I'm sure some of you today have got young youngsters who are going through the system at the moment, and my guess is they're being absolutely love-bombed with offers. <coughs> your, um, your chances of getting uh, uh, an offer, indeed in getting five offers against all your five UCAS um, applications have, have never, ever been higher. Right, onwards and upwards. So let's talk about um, UCAS's IT function. So, um, to be honest, that makes our current IT architecture look a bit more organized than it really is. But um, what, I'm, what I'm trying to put across here is that we've got each of our different application schemes, so the undergraduate scheme, the conservatoires, UCAS Progress, the 16-year-olds, the postgraduate, and so on. Each of them is in a separate scheme with a separate uh, system. So our customers' experience is, even though they might want to interact with more than one of those schemes, the customers' experience is that they have to interact individually uh, with those schemes. So for example, if you want to um, uh, apply for um, music or dance, drama, something like that, and three of your choices are in UCAS and two are in the conservatoire system, you have to go through it twice. Um, so this is um, a very expensive um, and a very cumbersome um, uh, process to run. Um, that's one of the reasons that we've outsourced uh, running all of this um, and our infrastructure to, um, to Infosys. Um, and that is going reasonably well. But just to um, look in a bit more detail, you know, here's what the, here are all the different components of our undergraduate service. So each service has got this many component uh, parts and they're kind of duplicated in the other schemes um, but um, and of course every time we need to make a change we need to change something in every single scheme so it's just unbelievably expensive for us to make what seem to our customers to be quite reasonable small changes um, year in year out um, is just costing us an enormous amount of resource um, <coughs> so we have uh, determined to move to a service-oriented architecture um, to provide the kind of hardcore architecture uh, for what we want to do. And what we want to do is a bit more sophisticated than that. So leaving aside that kind of core service-oriented architecture, what we, what we want to create is a kind of a single destination uh, for people who want to progress in education. Um, an ecosystem, if you like, so where if you log in as a 16-year-old to think about what, um, what, where to do your A-levels, um, the system will actually remember you when you come back um, as an 18-year-old to apply for higher education. And it will already um, have been logging what your GCSE qualifications are, so you don't have to enter those again. And so we start to build a kind of permanent profile based on the learner's journey through perhaps 10 years of key decisions about their progression um, in learning across those services. So that's the idea. So far, so good. And this was kind of what we thought. So every year we thought, right, we've got a budget that we can apply to all of this. We know we've got to keep spending on the core services so that we don't fall over on uh, A-level results day. So we'll put 50% of our resource to that and we'll have 50% of our resource building this great new um, ecosystem. Uh, and 
Yeah, that's probably what a lot of people um, think about. But I, I wonder if you experience this as well. So every year it's felt to me as if my kind of transformation plans just slipped away year by year. Because every year something urgent would go wrong with our legacy systems and we would have to pile the money and the resource and the people time into the sticking plaster and the bandages uh, to keep those shonky old systems uh, going. And the change budget was smaller and smaller and smaller. Um, <clears throat> And anyway, at the, uh, at the last, last September, we had our board strategy day, and we kind of, uh, the executive at UCAS, we kind of went on strike and said, we're not having this anymore. And what we proposed was what we've called um, digital acceleration, which the board were incredibly supportive of. And what the idea here was that instead of, you know, UCAS trying to do a balanced budget each year and sort of eke out its resources, we said we've got to accelerate away from this, uh, you know, it, that every pound spent on the legacy system is a pound wasted. It doesn't deliver better services to our customers. And we said we've got to accelerate away from this, invest over a short period of time to get us quickly off our reliance on these expensive legacy systems and increase um, the velocity. Um, and so that is what digital acceleration is about. We, we deliberately haven't called it a transformation program. I and mean, everybody has transformation programs. Um, and I quite like this idea about digital acceleration because acceleration means you do it faster and then you do it even faster and then you do it even faster and actually part of what we're trying to do is to build up that capability and velocity so that we get better productivity out of um, our development work. <clears throat> but of course, saying this is one thing, doing it is another, because what we're used to is a traditional uh, waterfall, prints to, uh, you know the, you know the, uh, the score here, <clears throat> where we kind of step through all these, uh, these bits of a program, um, and then um, sometimes a year or more later, uh, we get value out of all of this, but um, quite often we found um, that that year or so later, after we'd designed, you know, whatever this piece of uh, development was, um, it wasn't quite what we wanted anymore because, you know, too much time had, had gone under the bridge. Um, and, uh, and this started to feel increasingly uncomfortable. Um, we realized that this, this approach, this kind of what I call the big bang approach, where You've got to get it right first time. You've got to avoid change. You've got to set a requirement and then set about um, uh, meeting that requirement. You've got to collect all the information and budget it down to the last, every little detail before you start. Lots of planning, lots of big documents and uh, milestone dates and all the other stuff. Um, and it actually was uh, tying up a lot of our resource doing all that process and not getting on with delivering. And that's really one of the reasons why UCAS has now made a much stronger, um, uh, a much stronger commitment to developing Agile. And I'm sure some of you are going through all of this um, as well. So forgive me if, it, if it's, uh, um, all this is very familiar to you. Um, but uh, for us, this idea that you get started, you adapt as you go along, you embrace the change, you get reuse from use, <clears throat> you collect information um, as you learn, and you deliver working software as early as possible uh, and as often as possible, and that you build in um, this feedback loop. And that's, um, that's what we're uh, trying to do. So um, we've uh, uh, adopted an agile manifesto. So we talk about individuals and interactions over process and tools. We talk about working software, that's the name of the game, not lots of big documents about it. We talk about collaborating with our customers over negotiating contracts um, and responding to change in a live environment as opposed to um, following, doggedly following um, a plan. And really important word in the center of this slide, 
um, about trust, and that's not just trust amongst collaborating colleagues within UCAS, between uh, management and staff in UCAS, it's also trust between UCAS and its customers. Um, we're kind of getting used to some of these principles. This is, this is difficult stuff. I mean, this is, this is cultural change in an organization, and it's not just in the IT department that this is happening. Some of the ones that I really like, I don't know if you can see these all right. Um, you, you probably know them all anyway, but you know, principle number one, our highest priority is to satisfy the customer through early and continuous delivery of valuable software. That feels really great to me. I mean, I've, I've just died at UCAS. I, I cringe at, <coughs> I feel like how long has it taken me to deliver anything which I really think is valuable, better service and it's not enough for me just to keep the lights on and keep the, the handle cranking. Uh, the other one I like is number five. Build it around motivated individuals who've actually got skin in the game, who actually understand the customer, interact with the customer, and care whether we get it right for the customer. Um, and, and number seven, working software is the primary uh, measure of success. And so I really like all of this stuff. It's very much um, uh, still something in, in process. We're beginning to get a kind of a, a business model together. So we've got the five R's, reveal, refine, uh, realize, release, and revisit. Very, very small timescales over these places. Um, so, uh, and the team uh, is accountable for end-to-end -end, uh, delivery. Delivering early and often uh, optimizing end-to-end -end flow to deliver faster discovering quality and fast feedback. Now, I have to tell you a little story because I'm, really, um, I'm really chuffed about this. So, we've just um, delivered uh, a first piece of working software on a project called Identity, which is about um, customers registering with, uh, with UCAS. And the team put out a kind of a test site and they put it out to... Uh, colleagues within UCAS um, to ask for feedback. So I went on this thing and I pretended I was me and registered myself and so on. And then I gave some feedback. And the feedback I gave was, it asked me for my date of birth. Now, when you're my age, you know, you think, why do they want to know how old I am? And actually, most websites tell you why they're asking something like that. So I gave my feedback. And then on Yammer, which is our kind of internal comms network, I got the feedback from the team which said, Mary Kernick Cook was the first person to give feedback on this. This, for me, is complete win-win. Obviously, I feel really good about it because I've kind of done something. I've channeled some leadership or whatever. But also, the team felt good about it because they actually, they, 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 you know, the chief executive is actually interested and, and I have a means of being engaged in what they're doing. Not that I'm hoping to get that detailed engagement in all our working software. Um, but I just thought that was really good. Um, I really like this chart. You probably need to kind of look at this, but it kind of looks at the profile of benefits. Red is for agile, black is for traditional. Visibility, you get visibility pretty much the same all the way through with agile. Adaptability, you don't have, you know, on a traditional project, you've got the adaptability at the beginning, then you're kind of locked in and you've had it. With Agile, you can do it all the way through. Business value on uh, traditional, low at the beginning, hopefully high at the end, although not always in my experience. The other way around with Agile. And then, of course, the risk profile um, is different as well. Um, and those are things that, uh, that we're considering. Now, um, as I said, we're on this, um, we're on this journey. Uh, we're actually at Wagile at the moment. Um, I'm sure some of you are in the same, uh, same place as that which is kind of a bit waterfally and a bit agile. Um, and um, what's wrong with this is when you get in this betwixt and between, which I'd say for a lot of last year we were uh, around this area, is you get some people doing their old, you know, what they feel comfortable with, all our planning and the budgeting and stuff, and you basically just get a queue building up um, at the door of the developer teams. Um, and that doesn't really uh, work uh, either. Um, so, um, where are we now? I think we're a little bit beyond that. 
So we are rolling out agile thinking right across the, um, the organization. We're spending a lot of money on education because we actually need to train our developers, the people who are working in um, uh, product teams. Uh, we need uh, coaches and things throughout the organization. So we're spending a lot of money on education and training. Uh, we're getting some outside help. We're using a firm called Emergent. Some of you may have come across them. And they've just been really brilliant. They're just coming in and helping us just get started. We're learning about Agile in an Agile way. We haven't, we haven't planned Agile. We just started it one day. Um, and that has kind of, you know, up, uh, frightened the horses a bit um, uh, occasionally. But it, I think it's working pretty well. Agile to Agile got new initiatives with cross-functional teams, so we've got developers working with marketing people, with product people, uh, with communications people, with people people, etc. Um, we've got these uh, storyboards and things all over the place. To be honest, they're upsetting me a little bit because, um, as you can see, some of the post-it notes are a bit wonky and um, I kind of find it a bit messy, so I've, I think we've got some really nice kind of boards and things going, but it, it's really, um, it really feels like a place that's actually kind of marching through small bites um, of big projects, which is, um, which is really fantastic. The backlog is the plan. That's, um, that's the idea. So um, painful, but um, we are keeping an unrelenting focus on the prize, on the outcome that we want, which is this connected digital ecosystem uh, for people who want to progress in, um, in education. So just a, a few uh, reflections um, from me as Chief Executive of UCAS on, um, on all of this. So, you know, as I said earlier, this is all about culture and mindset. It's not just about um, IT. <coughs> I've kind of banned the use of this phrase. Uh, I don't know if some of you use it, BAU, business as usual. I've just, I've just come to absolutely loathe that phrase because for me, business as usual is just, is just not uh, acceptable uh, anymore. And we've even started thinking in an agile way about our core services. So the way that we're managing the core services, we're beginning to use cross-functional teams, uh, we're beginning to run that, um, uh, the legacy infrastructure um, in that way. Even on an exec away day uh, recently, we had, um, instead of an agenda, we had sprints, and I'm thinking, oh my God, this could have gone, this could have gone a bit too far. Um, I've also, um, by the way, I'm never successful when I... Uh, know, come out with these things, but I'm also trying to ban um, the concept of CRM. So I don't know how many of you have been, you know, trying to find someone to uh, implement and champion a CRM project uh, or probably revisit an old failed CRM project um, maybe several times over. Um, but we have as well. Luckily, we, we've never actually done it, so um, we kind of never got that far. We did some planning and some documents, but we never actually got very far. But for me now, it's very much about um, not CRM, but SRM, social relationship management. In fact, somebody at lunch was saying, well, maybe it's just relationship management. But what we're trying to get away from is this idea that all the communications are in silos um, and that communication is a kind of one-way street and that, that, that it's, a, you know, it's a single channel between one group of customers um, and the company. Social relationship management has a different dynamic about it. It makes sure that the company is listening to its customers. It's perceiving and engaging with its customers out there. Um, it, of course, it's publishing. Of course, it's content. But it actually gets us in a place where we can start to make sure that the content finds the right people to uh, connect with rather than the uh, learners having to find the right content um, that they want. Um, so we're doing um, some more work around um, all of that. <coughs> and I, uh, as I said before, digital is, I think, about people and it's about customers. It's not just about technology. And I have to say that since we um, got this digital acceleration um, vibe going uh, in September, I, as chief executive, I've never felt more connected 
to um, our technology function in UCAS. And I don't think they've ever been more connected to us, the kind of, you know, the exec leadership uh, team. Um, and it feels that they're much more engaged with the leadership of the organization. It doesn't feel like, you know, those guys in the corner, and sorry, they are mostly guys still, those guys in the corner, you know, who are either the, the root of all evil, you know, what's happened, oh, IT can't do it, etc. Um, or, you know, they're, they're the people who cause something to, to fall over or whatever. So it's been really great for me um, to actually feel that our technology colleagues have actually become properly integrated and part of the organization. Technology companies, and I do feel as if um, UCAS is a technology, hence my, my comment that the CV that, <laughs> that you read out, you think she's running a technology company, oh my God, what's the world coming to? Um, so um, technology companies do need leadership. And, and one of the things that I've reflected on, um, uh, UCAS doesn't use, um, uh, I was going to say the C word, but that would have come out wrong. Um, we don't use CIO and CDO and all of the, the, the C-suite. That's what I meant. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, digging a big hole here. Um, so, um, but but there's, there's two ways that you can approach um, the leadership of IT in your organization. You can look for an absolutely brilliant technology person and hope that they've got the leadership and management skills um, to make it work as an integrated part of the organization. Or you can actually look for an absolutely brilliant leadership and management person who's, who's technology literate and digital literate who can make that happen. We've, um, we've used the first model a couple of times. Um, we're now on the second model. We have somebody who's a, you know, who's a consummate leader and manager. Um, and I have to say that with what we're trying to do in digital and the way that it's integrating with the organization, um, it does feel to me um, as if that's actually working better for us at the moment um, and that um, bringing good leadership and management to the foreground means we can get some of the kind of housekeeping stuff, the, you know, the basic business model of how IT works, which perhaps we hadn't cracked before because we were always um, firefighting. So, um, so those were just some um, final uh, thoughts um, to leave you with. Um, so I do want to say thank you very much for listening. I've got one more plea for you, um, and this is, uh, this is just uh, uh, straightforward. I'm up to 984 followers on Twitter, and I'm desperate to get <laughs> up to 1,000 because I'm sure something wonderful is going to happen to me. Um, so uh, please do follow me on Twitter, and leave it a few weeks till you unfollow me, and then maybe I'll kind of... Thank you very much for listening. Thank you. We have got some time, and Mary has kindly agreed to answer some questions. So, if anybody out there would like to uh, pose a question, we've got roving mics. So, if you could wait until you've got the mic uh, in front of you, and I'm advised they are turned on, so you don't need to tap them. So, anybody out? First question, <laughs> Colin. And if it's a tough one, I've got my colleague Andy in the. Um, <laughs> Uh, Mary, thanks for that, Colin Addy. Um, you mentioned almost as a throwaway that you're using Yammer, um, central, uh, um, uh, enterprise social networking. How has that contributed to your sort of uh, change into agile development and agile working? Or which came first? Mm. Did they sort of, how do they go together? And what's the yeah. relationship there? We've, we've been using Yammer, I'd say, probably for about three, maybe even four years. <coughs> Um, for, is everybody familiar with Yammer? Yeah. Um, and it kind of just started as a, another way to do internal communications and kind of reach out to people. Um, it's, it's been a bit of a slow burn, but I think it is beginning to, um, to take off a bit more now. And so within the Yammer community, people set up groups um, and talk to each other. I prefer to stay on the kind of all company one. Um, I would say that it's not central. It's, um, it's, it's not a, a way we do work yet. Um, but it is part of the kind of culture of, um, of reaching out and sharing uh, information. And incidentally, we also have Yammer groups for our customers. Um, so I think there's a, is there a Yammer group for IT colleagues, Andy? Yeah, and there's a Yammer group for, you know, the UCAS admissions community as well. 
Um, so we've started to use that uh, to, um, to talk to our customers as well. But it kind of t takes a bit of time for people to get used to it. I think we've still got an awful lot of emails flying around if um, uh, that's the kind of still the main currency, I would say. Although people do talk to each other more when, when you get these kind of cross-functional teams. That does help. There's a question over here. Hi, Quentin North, University of Brighton. Um, one of the things I'm interested in, you talk about using agile development, and that sort of seems to point towards a, um, if you like, a principle of, of um, build rather than buy. Now, yeah. in uh, organisations such as my particular one, we tend to buy rather than build. And I'd be interested to know how you see that would work in that kind of agile development style, yeah. and whether that would work indeed. Um, we did originally think that we were going to do more buying and less building um, but it's just it's just so expensive um, and it's more difficult to get that real connectedness with your customers incidentally whether they're internal um, or external and so um, so we think we can get more bang for our buck by doing most of it ourselves um, that the cost to get you know X number of sprint teams uh, working on new software for UCAS is cheaper if we do it ourselves. The big um, uh, hurdle that we have, which I'm sure many of you find as well, is, um, uh, is recruiting in a very competitive market. And of course, Cheltenham's not exactly kind of leading, bleeding edge um, in that respect. Um, so that is difficult. But we are, we, you know, we're having interesting conversations with our outsource partner, Infosys, for example. They've got some models um, that we're um, looking at where um, they can actually run a sprint team offshore uh, quite effectively and they're going to share some case studies with that. So we're kind of looking at all options but at the moment we've, um, we've really, our first, our preference is to do it ourselves. Thank you. I have a question here. Uh, Jerry Nyman, uh, you were handling a lot of personal information perhaps, that's basically what you do. Do you ever worry that with the agile approach you might get some software out there that misses something <coughs> fundamental and uh, causes serious problems? Mm. Um, it, it does worry me. Um, luckily, it also worries everybody else because we've got a very kind of high culture of awareness around um, this issue. Everybody realizes that, that UCAS's reputation and the trust uh, that we're held in by, um, by our customers uh, is absolutely paramount. So we do have quite a high culture around that. Um, I won't pretend that we don't have um, information security challenges like any um, organization does. Um, and we've still, you know, we, have, we, have, we do our own internal audits on them. I mean, external internal audits, if you see what I mean. Uh, we do ISO 27001 and all of that. Um, and, you know, we've, we've still got a, a way to go. But we, um, I think culturally the organization really gets it that personal information is personal information. So hopefully no disasters in that, uh, that respect. I, su I suspect that some of, the, um, some of the information that we pass over to you, we probably need to do more to audit how you look after um, the information and um, you know, just uh, uh, not switching off and not changing passwords often enough, that kind of thing. You know, I suspect there's a lot more that we can do, but um, I'm reasonably confident that the culturally we're, we're well attuned to those risks. Heidi, a question here. It's a question here. Hi Mary, I wanted to ask about, not about IT, but about the slide that you put on with the four boxes. The winners and losers. Winners and losers type of slide, because my reflection there was we seem to be going backwards almost to when we had universities and polytechnics, and that we're almost creating that environment again by having, um, you know, numbers capped, oh, and uncapped on various groups. And I wondered what your view of that was. Yeah, I don't think it's going to be quite like that because, um, A, because I think that um, actually some of the universities I visit that I'm most impressed with in terms of what they do in terms of transforming people's lives, um, some of those 
uh, the biggest steps have been taken by the former polytechnics um, and uh, something very different to the sort of traditional Russell Group environment and so on. Um, so, uh, you, you know, you will see that um, on the winners and losers, it's, uh, I, I, th I think you'll have as, as many of all groups. And actually, if you're in the Russell group at the moment, you're in the toughest bit of the market because you mostly take 18 and 19 year olds and that's the population that's falling. You mostly take A-levels and so the number of warm bodies available for you to recruit is falling. You know, you could say the government's vibe is toughening A-level marking so you can't get the good grades. So actually, that's the kind of the hardest bit of the market. The growing bit is the sort of space that the middle and lower tariff institutions inhabit. Um, one of the key competitive uh, protections, if you like, with the numbers cap gone. So the numbers cap you could see as being a sort of protection against your competitors because your competitors couldn't grow. With that coming off, I think an absolute critical competitive weapon is your localness. So a lot, you know, you, um, university admissions is still a very, very local uh, business. And for those institutions that rely on a local market, they need to hang on to that local market because otherwise their uh, competitors can just aggressively offer um, and take their market away. But I mean, it's a very changed dynamic. It's a very, very changed dynamic. And it's, it's a buyer's market, you know. The, when I first came to UCAS, it was always about students scrambling to get into university. And, you know, it's more universities scrambling to get the students in. So it's a slight exaggeration to make a point, but it's, it has flipped. Okay. I have two questions. I've got one at the back with Peter and then one in front. Just there. <coughs> Peter Tinson, New Sizer. Um, we've seen with post or postgraduate admissions, a number of universities develop sort of almost bespoke admissions uh, modules, routines to improve the customer experience and make themselves more competitive in the postgrad admissions market. Do you see that there's a risk with the advent of increased competition for undergraduates that some of those? Uh, universities will look to do the same and break the shared services model that's worked so successfully for 50 odd years? Um, it's something that's always on our risk register. We're not allowed to use the M word in UCAS, monopoly, but you know, in effect, that is kind of what we are, very much with a small M, I hasten to add. And um, it's on our risk register. It's on our risk register because I think if UCAS ever had a sense of entitlement or complacency, then it really would. Uh, be our own stupid fault if that did occur. Um, so I'm very clear that um, the benefits of um, a centralized admission service um, are massive uh, and in all sorts of ways are um, massive. But um, if UCAS doesn't keep on sharpening the saw um, and getting better at it, um, then somebody might come and uh, nibble away at it. But just the final thing that I'll say, and I, I bear the scars of when I, when I first came into UCAS, I was all bright-eyed and shiny, uh, you know, fluffy-tailed and thought, right, we've got to, you know, do a process review before we build a new portal and all of the rest of it. And um, I've kind of learned along the way that one of, you, you could not set up UCAS today because you would never get everyone to agree and the only reason it, it exists and endures is because it's been going so long. And every time you try and suggest a change in UCAS, that change will always produce winners and losers. And so it tends to, it tends to kind of um, entrench the status quo, which is, which is a bit kind of queasy because I'm, you know, at heart I'm a sort of modernizer um, and, uh, you know, pioneer. Um, but uh, I, I think, um, I don't think there's a danger. I think that UCAS is an incredibly successful recruitment tool for universities as well as an admissions service. We're actually bringing, I, I, I think of it as being like Oxford Street. Oxford Street is full of customers because that's where Oxford Street in London, by the way, I'm talking about. Oxford Street in London is full of customers and shoppers because that's where all the shops are. 
and all the shops are there because all the customers are there. And that's kind of what we mean by this ecosystem, is if we can, if we can keep bringing well-informed applicants to your doors for your courses, then I think you will still engage in the UCAS process. And as long as you're all still displaying all your courses through the UCAS service, we'll have um, a, a, a way to bring people through the doors to us. But it's kind of always on our, on our risk register. Thank you. I think we have time for one more question, maybe two more questions, but one certainly here. Thank you. Hi, I'm John White from the University of Kew. This is not really a question I expect you to be able to answer, but I'd like your opinion on it. We, we hear that um, the cost of the present funding arrangements for the university sector are, are nearly as high as they were pre-student fees. And we've got one of the parties talking about reducing fees to £6,000. My question really is, um, do you think the student number cap coming off, will that make it to August? Or do you think we'll just get rush caps dropped back on us at the last minute? Um, if, if, the, if Labour get in and the, and the fee reduces to 6,000, is that the question? No, the question was really, give, given the cost of funding the university sector now, and it's not yeah. really either party, do you think either of them will think, um, well, now it's time to actually make the, the system lower cost, we can't afford to take the caps off, so we're just going to leave the... I don't know no, I don't think so. And, you know, the other thing, so um, Australia took the cap off um, student numbers in 2012, <laughs> And uh, they had a huge increase in enrolments. Um, and it took everybody a bit by surprise, and they had to scramble around to find the money, hence the um, ongoing discussions they have about uncapping fees. So what you saw in the Australian system when the cap came off was you saw a response to previously unmet demand. That's not happened here. The cap's come off here, and you know, we're going to struggle to stay in sort of 1%, 2% positive territory. Um, this year. So, you know, when this time last year the, the Chancellor got up and pulled the rabbit out of the hat saying he was going to um, uncap student numbers and it would allow 60,000 more people. I mean, that's an almost a physical impossibility um, by, by our calculations, unless you suddenly had a huge demand from EU students. That's probably the only area where you could genuinely grow. But there aren't another, there's not another 60,000 demanding wanting to go for higher education. So they could do that quite um, safely, get, get the great headlines, and um, you know, we're pottering along at pretty much the same level as, as last year. I mean, you saw the, what's happening to the population. Or, or, you know, it's still mainly an 18 and 19 year old game we're talking here. Thank you. I think one final question. Ian Little from Grenoble University of London. Uh, it's very interesting to hear you talk about the post 16 progression and, that, and the fact that after the post-16 stage, you have the information for the next stage. Should we be investing in single university student record systems or are you coming to the next stage? Oh, very interesting, very interesting. Um, well, I thought, yeah, let's do it. My colleague said, Mary, you must be absolutely mad. Um, so uh, it's not going to happen... But, you know, we're not going to do that anytime soon. Um, but uh, I think we'll be able to offer you much more comprehensive, much more validated data um, for your student record. And we should be able to manage a lot more of it for you. Um, so, uh, yeah, but my colleagues said I must be nuts to think about um, doing that. What do you think? Do you think we should? Well, we don't have a DBLA for caricature, do we? <laughs> Mary, thank you very much indeed for such an excellent presentation. And thank you to everybody for the questions. It just demonstrates the interaction that we need at our events to make them really successful. Thank you very much.